Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about supporting the blind and visually impaired with guests, Christine Benninger, President and CEO of Guide Dogs for the Blind, Kirk Adams, President and CEO of the American Foundation for the Blind, and Chris LaFollette, President and CEO of Arizona Industries for the Blind. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all for, for coming on. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, services to our fellow Americans. How do we uh, ensure that people can engage in civil society, in business, in everyday life uh, through mutual support, right? That's what we should be about uh, here in America. So um, let's talk about the kinds of support that you all offer. Uh, Christine, let's, let's start with Guide Dogs for the Blind. We all know you and your, and your mission but the details of how you deliver the, the supportive services um, and this companionship is, is so important. Could you talk about the mission and your founding, uh, your scale of operations? Sure, thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, Guide Dogs for the Blind is the largest guide school in North America, the second largest in the world, actually. And um, you know, our mission's all about empowering lives and it's through the use of a guide dog. So, um, you know, a lot of people think, you know, how, how tough can this be, right? You raise a couple dogs, you know, you find a few folks that, you know, are visually impaired and you put them two together, but it's, it's a pretty complicated process. Uh, we breed about 950 puppies every year. Um, those puppies are raised through a network of puppy raisers. We have 2000 puppy raisers in the 10 Western states. Um, we have two training campuses, one in, uh, outside of Portland, one outside of San Francisco. And we, um, you know, go through a huge process to, you know, qualify folks uh, to come into our program, ensure that they have the basic orientation mobility skills um, to be paired with a guide dog. And, um, that matching process, I will tell you, is, is uh, complicated. It also includes a bit of magic, to be honest with you, um, because it's, it, it's like me picking out, you know, someone who's going to be your life partner. So <laughs> it's, um, you've got to make certain the personalities fit. You've got to make certain that, um, you know, the pace, the pull, the... Um, you know, the way that the team works together all fits together. So- Well, and the important thing here is that you have a number of different specialists, right? The person who is receiving the dog is instructing you, right? And, and you're instructing them. So there's, there's a real exchange. Kirk, as you look at the various services that are provided to people who are sightless and, and visually impaired, um, how do you look at, at organizations like uh, guide dogs and other types of organizations in the, um, in the landscape of services to your constituents? Before I begin, Mark, thank you. For those of you who are on the call who can't see, I am a middle-aged white male with silver hair. I'm wearing a blue and white striped button-down collar shirt. So that's the type of information we like to provide. And it's just a very small example of inclusion. And that's really the theme. Um, we want blind people to be included in society at the same level as everyone else. And at the American Foundation for the Blind, we've been doing that for a hundred years. We're in our centennial year. So I will invite everyone to go to afb.org slash 100. There's some fabulous streamed uh, centennial content there. I, I, I've been to guide dogs. I've been on, on campus. I, I've been uh, Arizona Industries for the Blind. I've, I've seen the fabulous work they do um, with blind individuals firsthand. So um, there are lots of organizations serving people who are blind, um, kids, seniors, employment, guide dog schools, um, but the, the common theme again is, is inclusion. And we're just so delighted that our society is talking about inclusion in ways and at a level that we have never seen in our hundred years before. And uh, obviously a lot of that was catalyzed by Black Lives Matter and people are actually talking about systemic 
oppression and systemic barriers and how to create universal design and inclusion. And um, you know, Christine and, and Chris are leaders of, of two organizations that are, are shining examples of the, the work that's being done to help create those inclusive environments intentionally so that blind people can learn and work and, and contribute to their communities at, at the, the, the same level as their neighbors. You know, you're so kind and generous to gently correct uh, my error in terms of the introductions um, and also in informing us on a number of different uh, issues. You draw connection between Black Lives Matter and the idea of inclusion and diversity and equity. And um, that idea when it's applied to people who have various disabilities um, of different genders, of different races, um, it's, it's a, a transition that we all need to make. We all need to uh, become more conscious of. Uh, so um, I also, I'm a, I'm a white male. Uh, I'm wearing a suit jacket and a white shirt. Uh, have some glasses, have some gray hair. Um, and and uh, thank you so much for helping uh, this program to be better and me to be a better person. I really appreciate it, Kurt. Absolutely. Chris, um, could you talk a little bit about your operations uh, at, the, at, at Arizona Industry uh, for, Industries for the Blind? Well, look, it, it's, I appreciate it. Number one, I appreciate the opportunity in the forum, Mark. So thank you very much. And and to follow uh, Kirk is, is difficult. Kirk's a leader. Uh, he is Hall of Fame in this industry. He's done a lot of great work. He's, he's held several positions. It made a huge difference, not just in the program of people's lives. Christine, to your, your, your fact, uh, mobility is huge for us. Um, you know, key, key indicators are, are, are why we're dealing with some of the things we're dealing with is unemployment rates, about 70% amongst people who are blind or visually impaired or disabled. And uh, that reason is, you know, uh, is, is full, but one of the reasons is, is mobility, transportation, and uh, the opportunity uh, to be able to be mobile, to have transportation to get to work is key. So thank you both very much. I, Mark, look, Arizona Industry for the Blind, we, um, we're employment and training uh, opportunities here. Um, th there's a huge opportunity, we feel like, and it's been there for years and years, as long as I've been associated with the program 23 plus years, of unemployment rates, and that's 70%, and it's hung around that for a very, very long time. We're just trying to make a dent in it here, uh, creating meaningful employment, and we do so by doing things uh, and running some business units and creating relationships with the uh, commercial entities, and we sell those into, uh, into the federal government DOD operations in our, in our nation's uh, military. So with that, we use uh, things like base service centers in which we provide products to our nation's warfighters. We provide everything from paper and pencils uh, to body armor. Uh, we do so at, uh, at Luke Air Force Base. We do it at uh, Davis Mothin, which is in Tucson. Uh, and we also do it down in Yuma Marine Station. And uh, what's so important is we, we, we do so with about 75% uh, direct labor ratio, which is very important. So it's important for us to stand behind the employment uh, of people who are blind and visual impaired, but also give them the opportunity um, creating talent. Uh, so if they decide to stay with us, that's wonderful. If they decide to go work for a commercial entity, that's wonderful. But we want to train them, give them on the job training and give them the skill sets they need to be successful, not just in a workplace, but in life. Uh, we do also, we have a digital data scan, which is basically us uh, turning um, paper documents into a digital format uh, where we employ people who are blind and visually impaired. And our largest uh, employment uh, unit is uh, distribution. We have a large distribution unit here at uh, Arizona Institute for the Blind. And uh, we ship over 325,000 uh, shipments, orders a year. And we do that to a 99.7% on time delivery and we house over $110 million worth of uh, the government's products uh, with a 99.8% stock accuracy. Now we do that with people who are blind and visually impaired. And you see the smile on my face because those small little companies like Amazon and PepsiCo can't meet those ratios. So either we got a secret or we know who to go for when we're looking for a qualified worker. Well, you know, that, this is one of the things that I wanted to bring out 
Um, and and I, I did it in a, in a pretty uh, poor way when Christine made her point, this whole idea of the shift in power. So it's not just diversity, equity, inclusion, it's also about a power shift, right? And, and that power shift is a very important ingredient because if power doesn't shift, then diversity, equity, inclusion has no meaning, right? You have to have the people who are most affected be able to determine their own lives and affect society. So how do we, we do this in terms, of, in terms of providing these services? Uh, Kirk, do you, would you mind commenting on, on that assertion that I made? Uh, because you're more affected and you're more in the middle of this battle than, than I am. Yeah, and to, to build on Chris's point, so when, when COVID allows and you're within striking distance of, of Phoenix, um, call, call Chris and go tour the distribution center. It's, it's um, a sophisticated, up-to-date, modern 21st century technology, and it's all um, been carefully designed so that blind and visually impaired people can uh, perform all, all of the job functions. Uh, if you're in striking distance of San Rafael or Portland, Oregon, go, go visit the, the guide dog campuses and uh, hold the puppy, of course. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, the concept that we want to scale here is that being blind, being visually impaired gives you the opportunity to develop characteristics and skills and strengths that are important and valuable and desirable. So when we talk to a, a, an employer and we say, what are you looking for in, in your employees? They say, we want people who are creative problem solvers. We want people who have grit and resilience that can be flexible. We want people who can work in, in teams with lots of different kinds of people. Uh, Kirk, uh, we just had a disruption in your internet connection. Um, Christine, um, in terms of, in terms of uh, Kirk's point, this whole idea of, of uh, creating empowered individuals, um, when you look at the design of your campus and the design of your program, how do you uh, ensure that that is part of your process from puppy raising to the training of the dogs, to the matching, and to the sustained relationship that you have with your clients? Yeah, uh, that's a great, uh, great question, Mark. Thank you. And you know, to Kirk's point, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't describe myself when I first started. So, um, if I could just take a second, you know, I am um, female. I have blonde hair. I um, have glasses, and I have a background screen that uh, is a picture of one of our working teams, a gentleman with um, his guide dog walking down a street in San Francisco. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that, Mark. Um, but, you know, empowerment is, is really key, right? You know, when we feel empowered, really, there's nothing that we can't do. And so that's really the key mission for guide dogs for the blind. And that's what a guide dog does. It's not just about safe travel because that's what a guide dog does, but it's that bridge to the community. So when you talk about um, social isolation, we've all been feeling that right now, right? With the pandemic, that's something that somebody with a visual impairment feels on a daily basis because you can't, you can't really see your community around you. And, you know, typically if you're traversing the world with a cane, people have a little bit of reluctance to engage with you because cane, cane travel involves touching. And so people have a tendency to get out of the way. With a guide dog, people are automatically attracted to you. And so one of the things that our clients say is that what a guide dog does for them is engage them with the community because you're the most popular person in the room when you walk in with your guide dog, right? Um, but it's also that companionship, that soulmate that gives you that feeling of independence and empowerment. And from that, people create their lives in ways that are absolutely phenomenal. And I look at that with you know, our clients, the things that they do, the things that they tackle, 
I mean, we have people who are titans in business. We have people who are professional athletes. We have people who, you know, are raising three children on their own. We, you know, I mean, there's nothing that an empowered person can't tackle. And so everything that we do is set up to support that. Uh, Kirk, you're back on. You're centered on the screen. Everything okay. is great again. Isn't technology Thanks. wonderful? Yes, yeah, so I'm in. I'm in the wilds of Snohomish County, Washington, halfway between Seattle and the Canadian border, and uh, the, the wife, the little wife, little Wi-Fi issue. So thanks for bearing with me. No worries, no worries. You were uh, Christine uh, filled in so uh, admirably, uh, admirably uh, talking about how a collaboration works uh, with the clients of of Guide Dogs for the Blind, so that they shape their programs. Uh, to invite and be informed by input. Uh, Kirk, you were making a point about just that, the whole idea of, of, uh, of a power shift that is required and how you can end up with operations that are more efficient by taking input um, from, uh, from different communities. Uh, could you, could you uh, continue your point? Yeah, sure. sure. It, it's a race for talent. And if you want to win in business and competition and nonprofit and fulfilling your mission, you want to um, bring in the most talented people that, that, that you're able to. And if you create an inclusive environment that allows you to bring those talented people into your organization, you're, you're doing your, yourself a, a favor. If you're creating an environment that proves to be barriers, um, you're you're hurt, hurting your your ability to move forward and what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, another way to look at it is uh, if you have a toolbox, you want all kinds of different kinds of tools because you don't know what the job is going to be. We have a very rapidly changing environment. Um, we need flexibility. We need to be able to attack things in different ways. If you're hiring a lot of the same types of people. Uh, you, you have a lot of the same types of tools in the toolbox. If you hire lots of different kinds of people, then you have a wide range of tools, a wide range of experiences. And, and, and again, I just make the point over and over that um, uh, although blind people have traditionally not been given the, the, the same opportunities, uh, people need to look at blindness as, as a set of assets, as a, a way that people have built strengths that that are uh, desirable and valuable. It's, I think you made that point, right? The, the whole idea of abilities um, that shift when one particular door is closed, all of a sudden other doors are, are opened and the, that aspect needs to be valued and evaluated and then employed. Uh, Chris, you, you made that exact same point. One of the things that I found so fascinating by your brief, uh, uh, brief description of uh, Arizona industries is the industries part. The whole idea of competing against organizations like Amazon and being able to show that, that your uh, operations are in certain respects more efficient uh, and at, at, a, uh, at a different, uh, um, have different characteristics than one of the leaders uh, of the field. Could you talk about how you take Kirk's point and operationalize that? Let's just talk about the manufacturing process that you were referring to and the warehousing process that you were referring to. Well, it's a couple, Mark. And, and again, uh, some of my inspiration came from, uh, and, and I'm gonna embarrass Kirk. I, I heard him speak years ago and he said something about showing up to an interview. He did well, didn't understand why he wasn't getting the job showed up and they saw he's blind. Um, that shouldn't operate. It shouldn't work that way. Um, talent is talent. And uh, what our challenge is today is really showing the abilities rather than the disabilities. Because so we look at the working force, everybody may have a disability, maybe a knee, a shoulder, a back, whatever it may be. Uh, blindness is, look, technology is now leveling the playing field and it's helping tremendously. Uh, with, with, with people and the work that Christine's doing is helping tremendously because of the mobility enable them to get to and from. So uh, the challenge for us is finding the talent uh, because again, a lot of times there are, there, are, there are hurdles and challenges in the way 
uh, to get people in the workplace. Um, we find that getting that paycheck is motivation uh, for a lot of people who are blind or visually impaired. But there are some uh, and some hurdles there with SSDI that you can only make so much. So the, the problem I have is, is, is several is when I find that employee and I can pay a, a certain amount, well, the problem is, is they start losing SSDI, some of the benefits they get uh, for being blind, and, and they should. But we're having to fight regulations and, and legislature that, that is really, it's, um, it's archaic. So for us, it's finding the talent uh, to put people to work and really the desire for people to work. Uh, and I'm seeing more and more of and that. And you're talking we, about not desire from the blind uh, community or the visually impaired community. You're talking about the desire for society. That's you're correct. You're talking about, you know, what you're talking about is the systemic. When that's you exactly talk about right. systemic disparities, systemic racism, systemic disparities with people who are disabled, you're talking about our, we have a system in this country that forms a, a set of barriers to really having the country operate the way it should, right, Chris? Well, I agree 100%, and I believe Kirk is onto something bigger than, than we all know. And I think as it gets out and open, uh, a colleague of mine said, we're gonna, we're gonna get to this one conversation at a time. And I, I, I believe that. I believe we're getting closer every day. And, and, and to Kirk's point, because of these discussions and because of these, these things coming out on the today, uh, table today, I think we're able to have these discussions. You know, we're, uh, we would invite any questions that people want to contribute to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We just completed a poll and 80%, actually 79% of respondents felt that tax dollars should be invested to remove all barriers for blind and visually impaired people, 80%. Uh, the additional 21% felt that uh, private nonprofits should primarily fund uh, these programs. So the question that I have for, for you all, and I see that, uh, that we have uh, technical difficulties again uh, with Kirk's connection. Um, the question that I have uh, for you all is how do we scale? How do we change this uh, society? Because I think that the, uh, the private nonprofit sector is doing an awful lot, but in order to actually systemically remove systemic uh, barriers, we as a country have to be committed to that. Christine, how do you see that actually functioning in a way that advances toward a more just and inclusive uh, society? Um, uh, and, and can help, along with nonprofits, create sort of the America that, that welcomes and, and supports its various uh, citizens as, as their needs uh, dictate? I think it's a great question. And I think that there's, there's two things that need to happen. One, and, and I think Chris was, I love that comment about it's one conversation at a time, is education, right? Um, particularly with those that are, you know, blind and visually impaired, um, most people don't know somebody who's blind or visually impaired. So it's, it's not in the forefront of their mind and, and people don't understand what even those barriers are. But um, so education is key. Having these kinds of conversations, you know, helps to you know, raise visibility for these issues and get people to think, right? Um, but secondly, you know, we as, you know, nonprofit organizations, we as, you know, constituents, we need to advocate for these issues on a legal basis, right? So that um, there is access, there is accessibility, um, that, you know, there, there are these, um, so legally, you know, people have the right, you know, to be included. Um, and I think working together with education, along with, um, you know, some of the, you know, laws and regulations that are going to support um, access and um, accessibility, we can make strides towards breaking down some of these barriers. I love, I love the dual point, um, and um, Christine made the point, Kirk, that, uh, that we have a little bit of a social um, apartheid in that uh, people who are sighted very often do not uh, interact with and know no one who, who is uh, sightless um, unless they are part of their family. Um, 
and and I have a I just have a question for for ourselves for our own business, right? We do this work, and then we also have a have a unit that does executive search, and we're trying to to hire. We're always looking for talent for other organizations. Um, how does an organization like ours help to break down these systemic barriers and become a resource? to people who could do jobs throughout the nonprofit sector, but are visually impaired? How do, how do we enact in our daily recruiting work, in our daily lives, in, in, in our staff, how do we try to keep faith with the points that you're making, Kirk, in order to change how we operate, and how we think? Well, I think most, most basically is to broaden your concept of inclusion you know, you know diver if we started with diversity it was around race and gender we're, we're evolving um, thankfully as a society now we're talking about inclusion which is a proactive um, mindset and um, we're talking about universal design and making things accessible and available and frictionless for customers and uh, creating workplaces that are um, barrier free for people to be productive. So all, all these things come, come together. So my, my request would be when you're sitting down and you're writing out a statement uh, about inclusion and you look at, at the language that you have disability uh, there explicitly, that when you um, as an organization come out with a, an inclusion statement that you're, you, you are inclusive, of, of people with, with disabilities and you think that way. So you may think, um, you know, we don't have a lot of blind people in our talent pool. Uh, how can we change that? We, we know these three great organizations in the blindness field now, why don't we call them and have a conversation about what, what we can do to modify the work we're already doing to, to tweak it, to nuance it, to be more inclusive of a, of a broader scope of people. So maybe it's, it's a matter of including it within the thought processes, just sort of integrating it within the ideas. And, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, how uh, Guide Dogs tries to operate. It's, it's how uh, Arizona Industries tries to operate in terms of just making it part of the routine. I guess it's-, it's, it's yeah, it, Bake it into the cake. Bake it into the cake, right? Move it from, from the exception to the rule, right, Chris? Yes, sir. So uh, in terms of, of how the future should, should unfold, and I'm, I'm going, uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to uh, go around the room one more time. In terms of how the future should unfold for your organizations, uh, let's start off with Christine, then we'll go to Chris, and then we'll end up with, with Kirk. Christine, um, how do you see the future unfolding for uh, guide dogs? We're getting into more uh, of a uh, technology-driven world. Who knows, at a certain point, uh, there might be robotic dogs. We've all seen and, uh, and heard reports about the, um, the, um, these MIT uh, robots that are there. Um, how do you see the future uh, functioning? Because I can't imagine that, that a metal robot is going to ever be as uh, emotionally uh, satisfying as a companion, as a dog. How do you see your organization evolving? Right. So we're, you know, we're asked that question all the time. We don't see a guide dog going away and being replaced by a robot um, because a guide dog is so much more than just a mobility tool. I talked about, you know, that bridge to the community. And part of that bridge is how people become included, right? So we don't see the guide dog going away, but for our future, we are expanding our services. So we are looking at, you know, supporting our constituents um, with orientation and mobility training, whether or not you, um, you know, get a guide dog or not. We're expanding into youth services and we're looking at how we support our clients when, a guide dog is no longer the right solution for them. Um, so for you know, us, it's you know, how we can better support our constituents uh, to be able to, it's all about living the life you want to live and you feel empowered to do so. And uh, uh, Chris, we, we just completed a, another poll in which we uh, looked at 
um, uh, which measures people believe would be most effective. Uh, change in attitudes um, came number one, and number two and three, uh, both with 24%, was improved accessibility, the point that Kirk made, and changes to legislation and government policies, which uh, uh, Christine uh, also endorsed. Uh, so in terms of how you are going to evolve your organization over the next years, what do you see coming up? Well, it, it's, uh, and there's a book I like to read and, and I'll, I'll just bring a phrase out of it. You, you, get, you give a man a fish, uh, you'll feed him for the day. Uh, you, you teach that man how to fish, you, you'll, you'll feed him for life. We're trying to empower people through uh, employment, uh, we're trying to train uh, on the job training um, and then going out to uh, society, commercial and, and, and showing the abilities rather than disabilities. Uh, at the end of the day, we're, with innovation and technology, uh, it, 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 these things are leveling off. We're, we're being competitive and we see it happening every day. So for us, the future is bright. It's exciting, uh, but it's not without its challenges. And people like Kirk and, and Christine are helping us meet those challenges daily. Super and and Kirk, you're back and you're on mute. Yeah. Could you could you take it? First of all, <laughs> um, we we're gonna have to do another show, and we are going to have to do another show if you would be willing with your folks at at the American Foundation for the Blind because you have so much knowledge uh, that we need to acquire, and we'd like to have a show about changing practices. We'd Let's love to do that if, if 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 Kirk if Kirk would be so generous as to sign us up. <laughs> it would be an honor and a privilege. We'd love to do it. Terrific, terrific. Thank you all for for helping us. I know that the technology has been a little bit complicated, but this has been a fantastic show. You all are my heroes. Thank you so much for helping to uh, to uh, guide uh, uh, me and and uh, our folks. Thank you all for uh, attending attendees and uh, we'll see you uh, next Tuesday where we'll be talking about trauma uh, in the pandemic and how to treat trauma. Um, that's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay safe and mask up. Take care all. <laughs>